Welcome to the wonderful world of dance, bringing you exclusive interviews with top dancers and choreographers and reviews of the world's best companies across the globe. You can find lots more on our website at thewonderfulworldofdance.com. Hi, this is Savannah Saunders from The Wonderful World of Dance, and today I am so excited to introduce American contemporary dancer, choreographer, filmmaker, and artist, Jewel D. Lane. Jewel made history in 2012 as the first local and independent black choreographer to have his work commissioned by the Atlanta Ballet and was included in dance magazine's 25 to watch list, which is quite an achievement, I have to say, particularly for such a, a young artist. I'm really excited to have a chat with Jewel. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. So you're currently in North Carolina, is that right? Yes, I'm in North Carolina right now, and I'm teaching at uh, North Carolina School of the Arts summer session. And what it is, is just a uh, uh, a session for upcoming dancers or pre-professional dancers who want to have training and they actually come here and they get uh, contemporary ballet, composition, rep, and all of those things. So we'll have to add teacher to that long uh, introduction yeah, of, of your, yeah. your your different skills. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let's start at the beginning, Jewel. Tell us about, um, you know, growing up in um, Atlanta, Georgia, and how old were you, and why did you take up dance in the first place? Yeah, um, I actually started dancing because um, I just had a lot of energy growing up, and, you know, some of my favorite shows were fame. You know, I, I actually thought I was the character Leroy on the show. Um, so I was inspired by Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. Janet Jackson. And as I got older, um, I had noticed that um, I had a lot of anxiety, which you know, most teens do. Mm -hmm. And I was very shy and very quiet and I was painfully shy. And so mm -hmm. The the one thing that actually got me comfortable was this idea of moving my body. And so when I went to high school, I actually went to Tri-Cities High School, which is a performing arts high school in Atlanta. And my teachers, Dawn Atsum and Freddie Hendricks, they were very instrumental in bringing this artist out of me. Um, and it was there when I got like probably like the appetite to understand the arts and really know that this was something that I wanted to do. So um, from there, I actually ended up going to North Carolina School of the Arts mm -hmm. and I majored in contemporary dance. Um, once I graduated from there, I actually moved to New York and I danced with the Ronald K. Brown Evidence Company for mm -hmm. about six years. And in addition to that, I was also dancing with Camille A. Brown and dancers as well. So that's just like a little skim in the surface. Of yeah, that is, that is quite the skim of um, quite, a, quite a, a journey. I'm, I'm interested, um, I've talked um, before in this show about um, anxiety that dancers experience and um, I also have uh, feel very quite anxious and often I can be quite shy, which is weird for someone who hosts a podcast show. <laughs> but I'm interested um, how you felt that dance really helped you in the severe anxiety that you had as a child. Um, what was it about dance that felt really gave you a way of being able to sort of, I guess, move beyond that if you have or? Yeah, um one of the things that I really noticed is that when I was in the presence of performing or whether it was acting or like just simply moving my body, I kind of noticed that I wasn't shy. And that's when I started to kind of understand that, oh, there's a language in, in movement without actually saying words. And eventually, you know, as the years progressed, I kind of noticed that I kind of got out of my shell and I was able to actually just talk and just be myself because the thing about it, like, you know, and I always say this, the world has a way of telling you what, what you are mm -hmm. before you actually know who you are. And so dealing with all of those things, just trying to figure out, you know, is it okay for me to actually dance? Like, am I supposed to be doing this at the moment? So all of those things took a factor in that. But the one thing that actually um, made the most sense and made me feel extremely comfortable was when I was on the stage. And was there a, a moment or, you know, growing up, often um, male dancers talk about the challenges um, that they have, even just for being a male 
aspiring young dancer. Um, how was that for you when you were growing up in, in Georgia, in Atlanta? Oh, yeah. Um, well, the thing is that I always thought that men were not supposed to dance because, you know, they were automatically label you as gay mm -hmm. and all of those things. And so I just knew it wasn't uh, right. But at the same token, I grew up on a show called Fame and the lead character was a male. And so yeah. in the back of my head, I always knew that, oh, I can do this, but I just don't know if I have the confidence to actually pursue it. So when I got into high school, one of the um, beautiful things about going to performing arts high school is that you have people that are around you who are just like you who want to dance and you know and then you have a male teacher who is actually pushing that out of you so Freddie Hendricks was just a really wonderful example of just letting me be free and not only just me but for everybody who, mm -hmm. who actually studied under him and so he was my drama teacher at the time and so he knew that this was something that I was really passionate about but it was just a matter of just saying, you know, how can I make this young man come to the light and really say, hey, you can you can do this as a career. And so I'm just always thankful just for him. And did you was there a moment or was it literally watching that fabulous show, show Fan? Did you have a moment where you thought, I would love to do this as a, a full time career and how can I make that work? Or did was there a moment for you or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the moment came for me probably in my six-year-old self is when I used to cut up, like, you know, my leg warmers out of socks and everything, <laughs> and I would make, you know, these crazy kind of costumes. And I I knew I wanted to do this. I just didn't have the confidence to do it. And I guess at that time when I was seven years old, I really didn't understand all of the context that was in the show. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that stood out to me was just that this idea of this man soaring across, like, you know, my uh, TV screen. And it was something really captivating about that. And as I got older, I always said that, you know, I would love to do this. I would love to be like a background dancer. But, you know, how do I do it? How do I, like, get into it? So, yeah. Yeah. So when you graduated um, from the North Carolina School of the Arts, um, I think you focused there on contemporary dance. Tell me, yeah. what was your experience going into the professional dance industry after, after school? Uh, well, I actually got my first job with a company called Carol Dorfman and Dancers, and I got that right after school. And so I was really thankful for that. Um, I danced with her for about a year and, you know, making the big move up to New York was mm. already scary in itself. So it was kind of like, oh my gosh, I got this job. I don't have a place to really stay. <laughs> and so I kind of couch surf, you know, with some friends and, um, I danced with her for about a year. And then shortly after that year, um, once you get a taste of like New York at like the age of 22, it's kind of like you're this kid in like this candy shop like oh my goodness there's, 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 there's so many choreographers that I really want to work with there's so many choreographers that I actually studied while I was like you know back in um school and so it it wasn't until my friend Camille Brown had told me about Ron Brown and he had auditions coming up and he was looking for like a male and she said you should just go and I went and, you know, just by the grace of God, I actually got into the company. And from then, you know, just dancing with him for about six years completely changed my whole trajectory. And not only was I was thankful to be in his company, but I was just really happy to be a part of something that was um, essentially his legacy. So, so tell me about, um, for those perhaps um, over here in the UK or Europe who don't know too much about the company, tell us about the, the company and why, for the, why over that six-year period for you it was such an important uh, experience in your life. Yeah. Well, the name of the company is called Ronald K. Brown Evidence, and I was with them for about six years. And um, his work is deeply embedded in the African diaspora. And he uses a lot of sabar, which is a 
um, Senegalese style of street dancing, but he also fuses it with contemporary. And for me, it, it changed my life because not only did I develop long lasting friendships and essentially a family, but it was great to study under a black gay male. Mm -hmm. And so seeing this, this, this man in, in power and, and knowing that he can access his power and, and, and pretty much just, you know, change the kind of narrative for contemporary dance in itself was just really um, dope. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you described this incredible, um, for me, I can just imagine you, you as you say, your early 20s, you're in New York, you're working with this incredible choreographer, having this great experience that's impacting you quite personally. How did you um, move on from that and what did you take with you? And where, what was your next step? Um, one of the things I took for me is probably like a sense of, leadership and after my six years was up i kind of told myself like hey there are so many other things that you want to do and like there's so many other goals and dreams that you have and i knew one of the things is that i wanted to get into choreography mm -hmm. and i also wanted to go back into a little bit of theater just a little bit of that and i kept telling myself i was like well if you don't do it now when are you going to do it so it was kind of hard because like you know you're leaving this amazing company but at the same token I was like there are things that I want to do there are things that I've been burning to do so let me just take that leap of faith and sometimes taking a leap of faith is is scary and it's kind of like oh my gosh what are you going to do like you know for money like oh, like what's going to happen now but I think the thing that that I learned from him is, is that idea of leadership and just kind of reclaiming your power and just really saying, let me do what I need to do for myself as an artist. And tell me about um, becoming a choreographer or, you know, that, that drive or the inspiration to create your own work. Where did that come from? And what were you looking to say or to create? Right. Um, being a choreographer is, is super awesome in my opinion. Um, and I always tell people that I'm still like on this journey. Um, I guess one of the things that really was really enlightening for me as a choreographer is that I was able to create the kind of work that I wanted to do for myself. And in the beginning of my career, I always felt like it was a need for me to try to be fierce or try to do all these wild tricks and all these kind of things because I felt like that's how I'm going to get people's attention but it wasn't until I started putting like my personal stories in my work and once I started to get a get a gist of that that's when my choreography started to really come alive so and how do, how do you describe your choreographic language or your movement language I would describe my language as um I would always say fast because mm -hmm. I like to move fast it's always like that hyperactive boy um, still lives in me and he still comes out and he he radiates. So it's a fusion of like uh, West African, it's a little bit of hip hop. There's a little bit of um, this kind of language that I call ugly movements. And like, and the reason why I say that because sometimes the movements that we consider not pretty or, oh, that's not really considered dance, I kind of take those things and kind of make it myself and, and figure out how can I morph it into the language that I want to say. And what's your process for creating work? Do you work with yourself and create an idea or do you work with your dancers? Tell me about how you create. Most of the times um, my work, um, I usually get commissioned. So I don't have a company per se, mm -hmm. which I have no, like I tell people all the time, I have no desire to get a company. Okay. Um, Why not? I like the idea of just, you know, meeting dancers and going different places. And sometimes I'll have an idea mm -hmm. and I'll get into a space with some dancers that I've never met in my life. And I try to say, let me get inspired. Let me see how they move. Mm -hmm. Let me see what they, what they want to say. So I get a feel of how they move and then I kind of take them into my world. And so sometimes it's just a matter of me just 
teaching like a simple phrase mm-hmm. or I may have a piece of music and I may only have two counts of eight and I kind of go off of that. And so I always like to make the process very organic or I give myself permission to say, hey, just play, just play in the space and you don't have to be perfect. Um, so that's initially how we start. Um, and sometimes my process can be crazy and and um, people will be tired <laughs> and sore. But I think that's just like a testament of how I um, like to move. So And that fast pace you mentioned before. Fast tempo, fast tempo. But it, but not everything is fast. Mm. It's just like, you know, I like different little intricacies. You know, there, is, there are some slow moments, you know. I always tell people yeah. I'm not always fast. And your work covers political concepts, gender roles, LGBTQ issues, um, and you mentioned tackling some of your own life experiences. Uh, that's quite a, um, a topical and necessary subject matters to be covering. Tell me about why um, you cover these and what is so important to you. Well, the reason why I, I really tackle LGBT issues because I am gay. Mm-hmm. I'm a black male, mm-hmm. and I always feel like it's important for people to see themselves. So if there's somebody coming up behind me, I want them to be able to say, "Hey, I'm gay too," and you know this story is very similar to me. And I used to kind of shy away from those things, but again, you know, if when I put my personal stories in in play, they make the most sense for me. But I also wanted to be a voice you know even if, if if people come and see my work and they're not clear on what it is or they may not understand everything mm-hmm. I want them to leave the theater having conversations and, and, and being able to find something that relates to them and I and I, I I just think it's important because in the world that we live in everything is not always perfect mm-hmm. but I think we need stories I think we need like uh, narratives to really kind of drive, like, you know, or add to the conversation that's happening in the world. Absolutely. And as you say, even to inspire or spark a conversation between the audience themselves um, as a result of the work is such a, a great a great and necessary thing um, in this day and age, absolutely. Couldn't agree more, I have to say. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in... Um, the work that you're doing with um, the the companies, you talk about your your commissioned work, um, and do you get given uh, a subject matter, or are you able to bring those um, subjects with you? Tell me how that works for you. Well, usually um, commissions work where like a company or a school may hire you, and they never really give you a subject title. I think if people know your work, mm-hmm. they just want you to be able to create in the space. So I always kind of come with different ideas. And again, like it all depends on like who I'm choreographing for. um, What is it that I want to say? And sometimes I may not have those ideas right away and they may come when I'm in the space itself. So that's usually how it works. Um, And with commissions, sometimes you're given three weeks, you may be given a week. It just depends on like what what you do in that space and how creative you can be and how practical and strategic you can be. But at the same time, also making sure that your voice is being heard and being extremely clear. And you, you've worked or you've been invited by some leading companies. Tell me about some of the, the commissions that you've had recently. Sure. Um, I have a... Um, piece that's touring right now with the second company of Avon Ailey American Dance Theater and it's called Touch and Agree and that particular piece um, is very close to me because that's one of the pieces that really talks about my life and um, it's divided in four sections um, and it really kind of pans the scope of LGBT. I have another piece that is with Dallas Black Dance Theater. Mm -hmm. Um, They're actually on tour and it's called How to Kill a Ghost And that piece is actually about a breakup that I actually went through. Um, I was in a relationship with this guy for about six months. And now in that six months, I thought it was like, it felt like 12 
years and it was I was like it was only six months and twelve good years so huh twelve good years no 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 the relationship was only six months but it felt like I was in there for like twelve years mm-hmm. because we moved so fast in the okay. relationship but when the when the relationship dissolved I had the need to kind of hold on tight and I kept asking myself like I'm no longer associated with this man. Why am I holding on tight to him? And I felt like it was a ghost that was within me that I could not get rid of. And so that's why I called the piece How to Kill a Ghost. Um, my first piece that I did was on Atlanta Ballet. It was called Moments of Dis, D-I-S. And I was using the prefix dis because <clears throat> it was a idea of just not repeating the same patterns, like whether it was discombobulated, disconnected, and things of that nature. And, and that was just about life in general because I was at a point where I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. So, And you're, you, you make films as well, or you work, you work on film projects. Tell me about the, the films that you have been working on or the projects that you're currently working on in that space. Well, um, I don't have any projects at the moment, but I do have some films that are online. (laughs) I'm going to be completely um, honest, which I I may try to get back into that. Um, So so some films are coming soon. But one of the uh, first films that I actually did, it was called Just Another Day. And that was a, a, a film just about how we move every day, how we get up in the morning, how we brush our teeth, how we go to the store, how we walk through the airport, I wanted to play on like our natural rhythms. Um, I always get into conversation with people who say, oh, I don't dance, that's not my (laughs) thing, I don't know how to do that. But I'm like, the moment you wake up, there's a constant rhythm that's happening. So there's a constant rhythm when you're putting on like your clothes. So movement is definitely at the core of life. But people are not always aware of that. So that was my first film. And so um, after that, I had uh, some other films, so yeah. But and, and you mentioned one that I'm really proud of. Uh, and you mentioned I love that idea of um, you know every person every day when they wake up uh, has this movement. And when you were talking about that, it made me f- made me think of you know one's own heartbeat and your pulse and the the blood that circulates within having oh, having yeah. a rhythm. It's really quite visceral, actually, isn't it? I wanted to ask you as well about, um, you mentioned when we first started talking that you're currently teaching. Um, and yes. how are you finding, um, are you a natural teacher? Do you enjoy it? And are you finding you're passing on the lessons or some other things which you were taught when you were studying? You know, I hope I'm teaching good material. I, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm natural. I hope that I'm natural. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of the things that I I do enjoy about teaching is that I get to go back to myself when I was like maybe 15 or maybe 17 and like some of the things that I necessarily didn't get. So I'm in the position of power to actually um, give those things to students. And I'll try to be very honest with students. And I like teaching because teaching, um, it also inspires me and and it gives me a reflection of like, oh, okay, you know, it helps me practice patience. And I know that somebody did it for me. They took their time to try to, to try to mold me. So it's only right for me to do that. And I actually enjoy teaching. And so that's another thing too. Like I, I actually love being in the classroom, being able to break things down, being able to have discussions about the body, about alignment. And for the most part, I teach contemporary. And so I kind of fuse in my own style, but I make it very accessible where the actual student can get something from the studio practice. And your experience with this next generation of young dancers, how do you sort of look back and and think or look into the classroom and think, how different is the, the dance world that they're going to move into that you have been building a career in over the years? What sort of differences of challenges do you think that they have to what you had before, or do you think it's still the same? 
I, I think in some sense it's still the same, but I would say with this particular generation, there's this, um, sometimes there's this sense of entitlement or they want to know it like in five minutes and be ready to go. And it's like, it takes a little longer than that. And so I would say that there's a, there's patience and sometimes, uh, it, it, it usually hurts me when I visit performing arts schools and I see dancers who have been training for so long. And then once they graduate, they say they don't want to dance. And I'm just like, Oh no, like, Mm -hmm. you know what happened? And and, and I, I think a lot of that, um, it goes to the teachers and really make sure the teachers are inspiring and, and really keeping that passion going because once you lose it, it's like, that's it. And so that's probably the biggest difference that I've noticed because I know when I was coming up, it was all about, I wanted to be in a company. I wanted to dance. I don't care where I was. I was going to make a career out of it. And I think sometimes this generation don't feel like they can make a career out of it, but I, but I think you can. I think it just depends on, the people that you have around you, the teachers that are motivating you. And so that's what I really try to strive in the classroom is try to motivate them and really try to ask the tough questions and really try to make sure that they are being able to like go see performances and, and seeing like the different possibilities. And also being able to see a mirror of themselves too is very helpful. So... It's interesting um, because with you know, social media now, there's so much um, access to such a huge and a global um, landscape of companies, which um, I think when, uh, particularly when I, I was young, many years ago, dear God, um, <laughs> you didn't even know that there was this, you know, rafts of companies out there where, where you could have a, an incredible um, career and you could really you know, move or build it and change and different styles. And, and I think um, the young dancers now, if they are, do have, you know, have someone like yourself to ma- you know, motivate them, there is far more information for them nowadays than I think perhaps before through social media. Yeah, yeah. which also yeah. brings its own yeah. challenges for the young dancers, I think. That is very true too because I, I think, um, I mean, quite honestly, I think, there's some good things to social media and there's some bad things. I think the good thing is that sometimes people are hired off of their social media. And so I think that's really great. And it's also a good way to just access what's going on in the world. But then the, the downside to that is sometimes people post stuff and it's for show. And Mm -hmm. and I always question like, well, can you do that in real life? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like, is this what you really want to do? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting world for the the the, the next generation. I, uh, I'm yeah. interested. You know, the industry has been uh, you know changing. There's so much going on in the dance industry at the moment. What do you so you know? You've had your experience. You mentioned earlier. You know, you were um, a young black gay dancer from Atlanta, Georgia, um, and uh, you've built this incredible career. But what would you like to see or do you feel would be beneficial for the next generation to change within the industry um, if you feel there needs to be change at all? Um, I would probably just say more visibility of teachers teaching true dance and really teaching true fundamentals um, and just really knowing what you're going to say. And I say this all the time and I, and I always question myself as well. It's almost like, your your life experiences are so valuable to the dancer that is coming up. But at the same token, you want to make sure that you're getting vital information, that you know what you're talking about. You have experienced these things because it's nothing like being in a classroom with someone who's never done all these things mm-hmm. and they're trying to teach the next generation. So it's almost, you know, it's almost like you, you, you learn by, experience so i mean i guess that's that's one of the things and i'll go back to what i said before just patience i think that like you know the generation just have to have patience and research as well to to learn their craft and learn their the history and um absolutely i couldn't agree more Um, so you mentioned um you know about patience and um the the learning are there 
are there certain sets of advice that you would give to um, some, you know, the younger version of yourself, um, you know, to really motivate? Do you have any words that you you use a lot um, to help motivate, or you would love to have, or had said to you when you were younger that you would want to pass on? Sure. Uh, one of the things I would say is just um, make sure that you're fully present. And make sure when you're in the room, you have something to say. And I say that because you can miss an opportunity. And, I, and by being fully present, it's just being fully aware, fully engaged on what the teacher is, is giving you. Or whether, it's, or whether you're not in class or you're actually performing. Like just, just being very truthful and, and being able to hold the space truthfully. That's what I would say. That's absolutely wonderful words. And tell me, what's next for you, Jewel? What's on the horizon? Um, what is next for me? Well, there's a company that I've, 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 I've been so graciously been dancing with for a few years, and that is Camille A. Brown and Dancers. Um, she is the choreographer. Uh, she just choreographed for Jesus Christ Superstar, mm -hmm. and she, she's also the choreographer for Once on This Island on Broadway. And so she has a company, and I... Um, typically work with her um, on and off and we have some shows coming up so I'm really excited about that um, also I'll be setting a new work choreographic work for North Carolina School of the Arts uh, this fall and that's it right now you know um, I have some more things that are brewing and you know I'm just uh, super excited about the path that I'm on and just trying to stay focused that sounds like a very busy, um, very busy days and a great horizon for you to be looking at. It's, you know, you, you teacher, filmmaker, dancer, choreographer, artist. My goodness, it's a, it's wonderful to have so many <laughs> the sort of. Sky is the limit. I, I tell myself. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and and thankfully we live in a, a time where you don't have to fit into a box and you can be as many different versions and have so many different outlets. It's fantastic to see. It's been so wonderful um, talking to you. Thank you so much, Jewel, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. And for the listeners, you must check out what I think is a really beautiful website, actually, of Jewel's. It's Jewel D. Lane, J-U-E-L-D-L-A-N-E.com, um, which I think has got some really beautiful photos as well, and I think it really conveys... Um, uh, a lot of personality, I have to say. It's beautiful. And check out the social media as well for Jewel. Thank you so much, Jewel. Don't forget to subscribe. We've got some incredible interviews coming up with principal ballerinas and renowned choreographers. We love dance and ballet, and we hope you'll love us. Join us on Facebook and Twitter.